Watch this. Private militias have always been illegal in Idaho, but it might not stay that way. A bill has advanced at the State House, removing unnecessary regulations, say supporters, inviting extremists, say opponents. We lost a leader this weekend. Former Governor Phil Batt was fondly remembered by many. Today, we're taking a look back, way back, to last century, at the last governor to jazz up the highest office in Idaho. Speaking of history, a local artist used that for his latest paintings of Idaho yesterday and today. We're going to give you a sneak peek of the gallery show that opens tomorrow. It is illegal to act as a private militia in the state of Idaho. Has been since 1927. I mean, other than the state constitution forbidding private military units from operating outside state authority, there's a long list of groups who can gather and parade in public with guns, according to the rule from 1927, the law that is, and according to Idaho Code, only those honorably discharged or groups known as the, quote, sons of veterans and Boy Scouts, only they may parade in public, but only on Memorial Day or when soldiers come home from service or say in an escort service of a dead soldier or students at a school where military science is taught. They can parade in public with guns. All others pound sand. No body of men other than the regularly organized National Guard, the unorganized militia when called into service of the state, shall associate themselves together as a military company or organization or parade in public with firearms in any city or town in this state. That's the rule. That's the law. Well, for the second year in a row, the Idaho legislature is trying to repeal that law and make it so private militias can be out in the open in, in Idaho. Something the bill's sponsor says is already a thing in Idaho, despite the existing law saying they can't be. This legislation does not take a stance on the militia issue per se, even though armed citizen groups go back to the days of George Washington and his professed concept of having many small private militias for national defense a concept that exists today in the form of community watch groups, private militias, and volunteer augmentees to aid law enforcement in times of emergency. Private militias, you heard him say that, a concept that exists today, Senator Foreman said. His bill would get rid of a lot of the language that is outdated, written the same year Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic all by himself and then came to Boise, the same year a polio epidemic closed a lot of public schools across the state, and the same year the Egyptian theater was built downtown. That's how long this bill is or this law has been on the books. And it would condense that law to say no city shall pay for any such militia or give them a place to train or arm them, but a private unorganized militia, those who are already allowed to have guns by the U.S. and Idaho constitutions, they would be okay. And they can also parade if they so choose, with any weapon they so choose. What does parading mean? Well, that's a bit of this law that's a bit vague and not really well defined. As Senator Melissa Wintrow pointed out, that could mean parading in front of your kid's school or in front of a county commissioner's house. Senator Foreman says this bill is about getting rid of an old law that violated the First and Second Amendments. Opponents say it would just add weapons to a First Amendment right. If we vote for this bill, Idaho law will no longer have a policy that states you cannot uh, get together as a private militia. You cannot gather as a private militia. And those laws have been upheld again and again and again under the First Amendment. We have reached out to Senator Foreman to ask about this and how it would change things in Idaho. Because the question we want to know is, isn't it already legal to show up at protests, at rallies, at a parade, in front of a judge's house, in groups, with guns? I mean, if you've been around Boise for a minute, you've seen that several times. Remember the Black Lives Matter rallies downtown? The Pride Festival, maybe? Or the rallies opposed to abortion bans at the Capitol building? Well, this bill would remove the governor's authority over any militia and any city's authority to refuse to allow such groups to gather and demonstrate, to not allow them to give them permits in order to show up. It passed the Senate 24 to 9 and now moves to the House where a similar bill passed last year. Okay, so here we are eight weeks in to the legislative session. Day 56 of the 2023 session. The annual gathering which averages between 75 and 90 days. And every year the Idaho legislature has an unwritten goal of calling it quits by the end of March. Something they tried to put in writing last year. A 2022 bill that would end the session every year on the last Friday of March passed the Senate but died in the House, likely because the House doesn't like dictates when it applies to them. 
The year before, in 2021, the longest drawn out session ever in Idaho ended in November after 311 days because in May of 2021, which by then was already the longest session ever, the House refused to adjourn and instead went into an extended recess. You remember, we were in the middle of a pandemic and the House didn't want to be at the discretion of the governor when it came to how we handle any COVID stuff. That seems unlikely this year, with most already pointing to the end of March as kind of an end date. So we thought we would take a look at what has been done so far. And as of this afternoon, there have been 422 bills introduced at the State House, including one House Joint Memorial, which addresses Greater Idaho, and one Senate Joint Resolution, which would put making voter initiatives more difficult to get on a ballot. They'd put that to a vote of the people. The Greater Idaho bill sits in the Senate State Affairs Committee. The Initiatives Bill sits in the House State Affairs Committee. A lot of those 422 bills sit in some committee somewhere, and a lot of them will likely die there. But as of today, 17 bills have passed both houses and been sent to the governor's office for his signature. 11 actually have that Governor Brad Little squiggle and are now law. From the first House bill introduced, that would be House Bill 1, which mandates post-election audits of paper ballots have to be done by a hand count, to Senate Bill 1 to uh, 129, excuse me, Senate Bill 29, excuse me, which says a parent, separated parent, can't be cut off from a kid because of immun immunization status. In between, we've made post-traumatic stress injury a permanent possible occupation injury for first responders. We've had three laws dealing with driving in Idaho, four dealing with employment, and just one dealing with taxes so far. And there are six others waiting for the governor's signature, delivered to his office last week, which are due to be either signed or vetoed by tomorrow or Wednesday. And so far, there have been no vetoes from the governor. So the next few weeks should be fast and furious when it comes to what the legislature, legislature wants to get done and how many times Governor Little might be scribbling out his signature, of course. Well, limited schedule today at the State House. No committee meetings scheduled on the House side, and the Senate adjourned a bit early, going out with a tribute to former Idaho, Idaho Governor Phil Batt. He passed away Saturday morning on his 96th birthday, which is also the 160th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln making Idaho a territory. On Idaho Day, Governor Batt served as Idaho's 29th governor from 1995 to 1999. And during his political career, he also served as a legislator, a lieutenant governor, and Idaho Republican Party chairman. Governor Batt was also known for his fierce dedication to human rights. Governor Batt chose to serve just one term and left the governor's office in 1999 at 71 years old. Prior to that, toward the tail end of his four-year term, KTVB's Michelle Hicks caught up with the outgoing, in more ways than one, governor. I want to say it's a high honor and a rare privilege to serve as your governor. Governor Phil Batt reflects on his four years in office. To the best of my ability. To the best of my abilities. That began on this snowy day in January. <laughs> During his first Idaho State of the State address, the governor got Idaho, right Idaho. to business. Let's get this show on the road. One of his first moves, negotiating now. a nuclear waste agreement with the federal government. He took a lot of heat, but the outgoing governor believes it was one of the most important acts of his administration. I know that the compact we were able to achieve is very much in the interest of Idaho. We gave away very little in order to gain a lot. The governor also cites passing farm worker compensation insurance as another important achievement, even though the measure cost him some friends. I think uh, a lot of farmers got unjustly lambasted during that uh, discussion. That part of it I regretted. The governor says he doesn't like the criticism that comes with the job, but he does enjoy the perks. Like the attention he receives taking center stage with his clarinet. Bill's just a good all around human being. Senate About Majority uh, Leader Jim Risch served like side by side in the late Senate. 70s with so then Senate Pro Tem Bat. It certainly was a fitting culmination to his uh, years of public service that he could serve as governor. Hi there. Hello there, thank you so much. Appreciate Merry it. Merry Governor Batt is as generous with charities as with his years of public service, to put in more than 30. He started as a top student at Wilder High, who developed into a distinguished yet approachable state leader. Hey, did you hear your good Oh, golly, it's high time I left. No, no. Michelle Hicks, Idaho's News Channel 7. Yeah, and while that story did focus on his time on the second floor, Phil Batt will likely be remembered for more of what he did as a state legislator. They kind of touched on it there, Michelle did. Being at the forefront to help form Idaho's Human Rights Commission, an onion farmer 
Matt was also a huge supporter of farm workers, as she mentioned, when it came to what they were paid and how they were covered by workers' compensation, despite what the rest of his party may have thought. At the time he was elected in 1994, he became the first Republican governor in 28 years in Idaho. There hasn't been a Democratic governor since. We've seen a lot of response to Bat's passing over the weekend, including from many leaders. U.S. Senator Mike Crapo releasing a statement saying, in part, Idaho Governor Phil Batt will be remembered as a strong and thoughtful leader dedicated to the people of Idaho and advancing human rights in the state. He went on to say, as Idahoans remember him, much will be said about his legacy to Idaho and the debt of gratitude we owe to him. He was a life well lived, and he will have my unending admiration and respect. Governor Brad Little said in part, Governor Phil Batt was the epitome of a public servant. Having served as governor, lieutenant governor, and senator, his legacy is distinguished by his unrelenting human rights leadership, determined fiscal conservatism, and enduring love of Idaho. Lieutenant Governor Scott Bedke also released a statement saying, in part, Governor Phil Batt was the embodiment of a dedicated public servant, a man of fairness and decency. Governor Batt served our community with a commitment to protect our lands, fight for human rights, and ensure fiscal responsibility. Governor Batt will lie in state at the Capitol. No date or time has been announced for his funeral, but until then, flags will remain at half staff. Don't you just love looking at old pictures of what life used to be? Like old buildings in downtown Boise. It's so different than what it looks like today. And one local artist thought, you know what? That's pretty cool. So he painted it. How? Well, we're gonna show you after the break. But this is the time we want you to send in your comments and your questions. Text them to us to the number on your screen, 208-321-5614. Don't forget to add your name and the hashtag, the 208. That's how we know it's meant for us and from whom it comes. And we might even read yours at the end of the show, so just make sure you keep them clean and concise. Oh, and clever helps. Well, if you've been a part of the 208 like we have for the last few years or so, you've noticed, well, we love history here. Usually, like weird things, love triangles, old, odd newspaper articles, that kind of stuff. History of Art, though, is also compelling. There's an opportunity for you to go and check out some of Idaho history for yourself by way of art. Mark Schauber is a local artist living in Eagle. He started out as a successful graphic designer, but later, he dedicated himself fully to become an artist, and it paid off because well, now he's the artist behind the new gallery show at the Initial Point Gallery in Meridian. It's called Yesterday and Today. Schauber painted pictures based on photographs from the Idaho Historical Society, showing Idaho images from, well, yesterday and today. I decided that I wanted to do something kind of special instead of just showing my existing work. I thought it'd be fascinating for me and for maybe the public to uh, sort of highlight some historical images of the past. My name is Mark Schauber, and the show is titled Yesterday and Today at the Meridian City Hall Initial Point Gallery. The show really happened when I, I started researching photographs. That's how I paint, I paint from photographs. I found just a treasure trove of really fascinating, beautiful images with the Idaho Historical Society. 
1800s, early 1900s, I would say most of these pictures are from. The most inventive part of the whole process was that I had to, I wanted to add color. I didn't want to make them all just black and white images. That was a fun part of it, but I still wanted to give it kind of a old style kind of looking photograph, not bringing contemporary bright colors into it. A lot of the pictures do kind of show different forms of transportation. We got the, the covered wagon, you got the old roadster kind of car, the train was a big deal, it still is, right? Part of the thing that, that stuck with me or what I was trying to project maybe with my selection of the pictures was, you know, how different those times were and how hardy those people were and how tough those people were and, you know, their, their drive and motivation to come across the country or just those times, right? I, I was hopefully captured some of that. But it is also interesting when you look at the people in these pictures, a lot of them are close enough to see the expressions on their faces and they look real happy. I mean, you know, those were the times people, you know, a lot of good things were, were in those times too. It wasn't all struggles and strife, you know, lived great, hearty, successful lives, and they made everything that we have today possible, really. So the today uh, part of the show, what I do is I go out and I just do little missions where I drive around and I'll take pictures of things that, that you know, catch my attention. I'll take a picture of an old barn or something that's even just by my house. And then ne next month, <laughs> you know, next month it's gone. But yeah, there's a, there's some images in the show of, the, of places that don't exist anymore, and, and I didn't know they were going to go out. So I'm kind of lucky. It's almost like I'm archiving some of the history. Rockies isn't there. It's 50 years it was in business. They're kind of nostalgic, almost images. A lot of my stuff is. You know, I have a certain. Like if it's a house, it's probably not going to be a real modern construction house. It's going to be an older home and it has some history to it, you know. And then, you know, the way the light hits it, <laughs> that's the, everything for me. Painting really is a lot about, you know, the light and the, the shape, the colors, you know. There's so much, so many beautiful uh, places to discover and things to, to paint here. So I'm really excited about the future. Maybe there's some spots in there that you might recognize. So if you want to go take a look at it for yourself, kind of immerse yourself in some history, you can do that. The show opens tomorrow at the Initial Point Gallery, which is on the third floor of the Meridian City Hall. You can even meet Mark, the artist. Just go to the opening reception tomorrow. That's from 4.30 to 7, and it is free and open to the public. But if you can't make it tomorrow, that is fine. The gallery show will be open until the end of the month. The Iditarod is underway, and last week we told you we got an Idahoan competing in it. After the break, we're going to tell you where he falls in the pack. And another reminder, we want to hear from you. Share with us what you think about the show or pretty much anything what's going on in the 208. Text this number, 208-321-5614, and include your name and the hashtag the 208. And if you stick around, well, you could see yours at the end of the show.
March has started roaring like a lion and winter weather holding on strong. 3.7 inches measured at the Boise Airport of snow through the month of March so far, really just through the first week here and the entire average for the month of March, only 1.2 inches of snow. In fact, we've had at least a trace of snow every day since February 26. That's nine consecutive days again as winter weather continues to move through. And for those of you wondering, yes, grapple counts as the snow tally out at the Boise Airport. So those times when we see some grapple showers as we have today, as we have through the entire weekend, those little snow pellets, it almost looks like a bean bag was ripped apart in the sky and all the styrofoam fell out. That's what we're seeing. And it takes a little bit of um, instability in our atmosphere, a little bit of convective nature moving through. And we'll see that again tomorrow into Wednesday as well with some more snow showers on tap for us as well. You can see some scattered showers moving from southwest to northeast, slowly through the lower end of the Treasure Valley, north and west of the Boise area and also south and east of Mountain Home all the way down along I-84 and into Twin Falls. I would count on the potential for slick travel uh, through the next couple of days along that I-84 corridor. Just take it as winter weather driving. So this low pressure center is just going to hang around, keeping spokes of energy and moisture moving through the region throughout this entire week ahead, keeping that winter weather pattern around with us as well. And we're also really watching a first alert weather day for Friday where it's cold enough at the start of our precipitation to push in a lot of snow and then eventually changing over to rain. One thing we can count on is very gusty wind with the significant system setting up. It looks like another atmospheric river setup with that fire hose poised on California and moving some of that moisture in our direction as well. So snow totals, still some of those details that we need to iron out, but it is again one of those days that we're really watching very closely through this week ahead. Also, here's a reminder reminder for you maybe a sign of spring we spring forward an hour with the clock this weekend as daylight saving time begins you can find the freshest forecast at ktvb.com all right, last week we told you about an Idahoan racing for his first time in the Iditarod and we told you we were going to try to keep up to see if he can keep up we introduced you to Jed last week He's a Sandpoint resident and the only Idahoan competing in that famous sled dog race this year Race took off yesterday, so mushers are just about a day into this multi-day, thousand-mile race, and there is Jed. Earlier today, he was around 26, but since this afternoon, he's dropped lower in the pack. He's 30th out of 33 right now. Not doing so well, but he has plenty of time to get back in the mix, as you well know. It's a lot of days. The race has only just begun. And again, we're going to continue to keep an eye out for our friend Jed and let you know how he's doing and see if he can fulfill his lifelong dream. Well, he is fulfilling it of mushing at the highest level. We're going to let you know if he can reach the ultimate goal of maybe possibly coming from this far behind and winning the Iditarod. So stay tuned.
All right, let's get to your comments uh, for this Monday as we get into the work week. Second Amendment specifically calls for a well-regulated militia. You want to march with your gun, then join the National Guard and follow laws and rules for that. The militia connotation is used for those who want to unlawfully work around the laws. Well, pretty soon, if this goes any further, it won't be unlawfully. Scott, according to the bill. So Washington had small armed militia. This is not the 18th century, according to uh, Vance. So that's pointing out the part that, yes, the well unregulated or well regulated militia, I should say, talking about Washington's time. What does law enforcement think about letting armed groups of the insecure, the aggrieved, and the unstable roam our public spaces unfettered? Pat's his voice. Well, I don't know that that's not already happening, but as a group, maybe as a militia, Senator Foreman said he's talked to several lawmakers, law enforcement officers in his district. And they seem to support his bill to get rid of the 1927 law and replace it with this much shorter, allowing more uh, possible militias in the state of Idaho. BLM movement was quiet in Boise. No buildings burned, no one hurt. That's because there were patriots there with their guns. The Second Amendment has a purpose, which is interesting. Reed, I think, set that in. Every time we ask them why they show up to these rallies, whether it be at the March for the Capitol or whatever, even the BLM rallies, we're told they're there, not as an intimidation tactic, but just expressing their Second Amendment rights. But you're saying it was because of intimidation. Lovely comments from many Republicans currently in the legislature. There's a big gap in what they say and how they legislate, says Kristen, and that's backed up by this. I find it ironic that Idaho politicians praise Governor Batt for his work in human rights while they work to remove the rights of women and the LGBTQ citizens of Idaho, says Sage from Boise. Kind of the same train of thought there. Great admiration for the former governor. May he rest in peace, and he served in a time when politicians could get along and get things done. We'll see you tomorrow.